Hello, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone tuning in from around the world. I'm J.D. McCartney, the Chief Communications Officer at Financial Planning Standards Board, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you today to the latest installment of our Financial Planet Live webinar series. We host these events to provide education and inspiration for the financial planning community, and that includes our global network of 192,000 certified financial planner professionals. So today's conversation is focused on technology to take your financial planning practice to the next level. And right now we're broadcasting this event across our FPSB social media platform. So if you haven't already, I'd like to invite you to follow us, friend us, connect with us on social media so you can grab the inside information and, and invitations on, on our future events. But for now, uh, it's on with the show. So we have a great conversation lined up hosted by Suzanne Chiesti, uh, just over here to my right. Welcome to Financial Planet Live. Uh, Suzanne joins us from London. She is the CEO of the European Investor Network FinTech Circle, and she founded the FinTech Circle Institute also, which offers workshops and learning for C-level executives. She is also the co-editor of the bestseller, The FinTech Book, The Wealth Tech Book, The Insure Tech Book, The Pay Tech Book, The AI Book, and The Legal Tech Book, published by Wiley. So I think it's safe to say she knows her tech. Uh, Suzanne has also been a commentator on CNBC and a guest lecturer at the University of Cambridge and Warwick Business School. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much, JD, for having me. And now, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Michael Kitsis, CFP, and I should also add probably about other 15 certifications and credentials that you carry. Uh, but today you're a certified financial planner professional first and foremost, we appreciate that. Uh, Michael joins us from the US in Reston, Virginia near Washington, DC and is the chief financial planning nerd. Now that's his word, uh, not mine, uh, at kitsis.com where he works to advance knowledge in financial planning and help make financial advisors better and more successful. Michael is also the head of financial planning strategy at Buckingham Wealth Partners, the co-founder of the XY Planning Network, Advice Pay, New Planner Recruiting, FP Pathfinder, and FA Bean Counters, the former practitioner editor of the Journal of Financial Planning, the host of the Financial Advisor Success podcast, and the publisher of the popular financial planning industry blog, Nerds I View. So Michael, it is a real pleasure to welcome you to FPSB Financial Planet Live, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your uh, advice and your insights. Thank you, JD. Really appreciate the opportunity to join everyone in our, our growing ranks of CFP certificates around the globe. That's right. So with that, Suzanne, I want to turn it over to you to lead our conversation with Michael. Uh, enjoy, and I will see you both on the other side. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Shady, and welcome to all our guests for joining us today. A good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. It's wonderful to have you with us. And what we want to do, Michael and I, is to really provide a very interesting dialogue, an interesting conversation to help you help get help and technology insights, how to take your financial practice to the next level. So very strategic, very practical to really help you make a difference, you know, to your clients, for your own business, to grow your business post COVID as well. And that's, of course, a very important topic because FinTech impacts the practice of financial planning globally. And today we want to go drill down in more detail how it does it, you know, what tools are available and what you need to know to be future proofing your practice. And so we will talk about big picture of tech strategies, such as how tech can improve efficiencies, for example, we will how it can help you service your clients better, and also how to stay on top of the latest technology advancements. So these are the key topics uh, we will cover today with Michael. And I'm so happy and pleased to be able to interview Michael uh, because I've been following Michael for a long time already across social media, learning from his insights uh, and his wisdom. Uh, and so it's wonderful to be able to talk to you, Michael, in person today, uh, and also for the benefit of all our financial planners here worldwide who want to you know, uplift and, and kind of improve 
improve and invest in their own practices. So maybe, Michael, if we can start out with the first question, which is all about the role of technology. And, and maybe if I can ask you, how do you think is technology disrupting financial planning practices today? It's a great question, Suzanne. I, I, I do think there's a lot of disruption that's flowing through from, from technology, but but candidly, not not the way that we tend to think of, I think, technology disruption. So I, I look at this from a, a very broad perspective. So if I if I kind of throw the ball back 40, 40 or 50 years ago, and I looked at like the financial advisor of the past, you know, when CFP marks were first getting started, typically like a financial advisor was a stockbroker in most countries. Like sold individual stocks, got paid to trade individual stocks uh, until the 1970s. And we had the first technology disruption of financial advisors, otherwise known as the computer, showed up. And we started using them on our desks and we started using them in the back office. And particularly in the context of the investment industry, we started using them to facilitate brokerage. And most countries around the world had some kind of rise of technology-driven discount brokerage and stock trading commissions fell like a rock. And the individual advisor model of selling stocks as the primary vehicle for implementing recommendations with clients fell by the wayside. It was to me like the first great disruption of financial advisors, except we're still here. It didn't actually eliminate the advisor. It just said, well, we don't get paid to give clients access to stocks anymore because you can buy that from a discount broker. So we said, well, we'll have a better value proposition. I'll find for you a professional stock manager. So we went in the mutual fund business. So then the mutual button business had a great run for 20 years through the 1980s and 1990s. Then we got another technology disruption. The internet showed up and a bunch of technology platforms said, well, we can just put every possible mutual fund in like a giant supermarket online and you can just go online and buy any mutual fund you want. Suddenly clients didn't need us to buy mutual funds anymore. And so it was another great te technology disruption of the financial advisor business model, but we're still here. Right, we moved up the value chain again. We said, well, anybody can buy a mutual fund online. I will create for you a diversified asset allocated portfolio of them. Right. And so we saw the rise of the funds under management, assets under management model around the world. We now had a great run at that for 20 years. And now, once again, you're seeing the same round of technology show up. First, we had computers that disrupted stock brokering. Then we had uh, the internet that disrupted uh, uh, mutual fund picking. Now we have the rise of so-called robo-advisors, but really just automation of technology for doing asset allocated diversified portfolios. And we're taking what used to be that primary value proposition and we're, and we're simplifying and automating with technology. And so to me, once again, like it, it starts to create those pressures around disruption, but not in, I think, how we tend to talk about disruption in sort of general media parlance of like, you know, so-and-so got disrupted and they got obliterated. Like digital cameras showed up and then Kodak was gone in five years. We're not looking at that kind of disruption. The disruption that happens instead is we take the business model of the past 10 and 20 years, we increasingly automate it with technology and we use that as the foundation to build the next value layer on top. And so I do think we are in the midst of one of those transitions, but it's not a technology disrupts the financial advisor and all of a sudden we have to worry about whether we're going to be here. We've actually survived and thrived in the long run through every single one of these technology disruption waves when they came through. But it often changed the advisor business model. It definitely changes the advisor value proposition. And I do think that collective pressure I, we are feeling sort of around the world right now as technology comes in, increasingly automates a lot of investment things that we used to do as our big value proposition. And is raising the question like, well, what's the value add on top? Which kind of apropos to our discussion today to me is, is all about financial planning, the advice we add beyond the portfolio, and is why I think you see such a bullish growth in CFP certificates around the, around the world. Like it, it is the next value add layer on top of what the technology is increasingly automating. Excellent. I think it was a, a great summary, Michael. And I think it really uh, summarizes the technology is nothing bad. You know, technology actually is a good force for change, a driver for change. And as you said, the technology helped, you know, financial planners to actually add more value to clients today than never before, because now technology builds a foundation, the basis on which to add 
more services on top. And you, you spoke about robo advisors, you know, and how they help build asset allocation models diversified across various asset classes. But where do you see the limitations of robo advisors today? Well, ultimately, to me, the the uh, the biggest limitation around around robo advisors is just all, all they do is create an asset allocated diversified portfolio. Which like is a fine thing. It's essentially a version of a product offering, but but that's as far as it goes. And at the end of the day, people who buy their own products themselves, e, 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 I, uh, I uh, online through robo advisors. You know, we have a label for them. They're called self directed investors or do it yourself investors. They don't they don't use advisors. They compete with to do it yourself platform. So you know, when when robo advisors first came in the U.S., we had written an article all the way back in 2012 that said robo advisors are no threat to human advisors because the people who use them are largely self directed investors. They're really a competitor to self directed investors. And so we had said at the time, like the primary two competitors for robo advisors would be the major do it yourself platforms in the U.S., which is Vanguard and Schwab. And within three years, the first two platforms to launch competing services in the U.S. were Vanguard and Schwab, uh, both of whom now have built offerings that are significantly larger than retail robo-advisors. Uh, and to me, just when we look broadly, robo-advisors really ultimately never were the threat here and just literally didn't add up to very much market share. You know, there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of global buzz around Betterman is now the largest robo advisor in the U.S. It has more than thirty billion dollars under management, which is not a not a trivial number. But you got to re remember that the U.S. investable market is tens of trillions of dollars, and so you know when when the largest, most successful retail robo advisor and basically the only one that survived because almost all the others in the U.S. went out of business. When the largest retail robo advisor got less than one percent market share after a decade, like that's not what disruption looks like. That's a niche. That's a small niche of a certain segment of self-directed consumers that just wanted to hand off to a technology platform to automate. Uh, you know, I, I still know individual human advisors who over the past 20 and 30 years have built larger advisory firms by themselves than Betterment did with a hundred million dollars of venture capital as the great disruptor. Yes. So yeah, yeah it, it's fine to recognize them as automating, automating portfolio management is great. But to me, where you're actually seeing the rise of, of so-called robo advisors is we're using them in our firms. Advisors are using them. We usually have different labels like, trading and rebalancing software and model management tools and model marketplaces. But it's all functionally the same thing, which is we are taking this value proposition we used to have where I would do all this analysis to create a diversified asset allocated portfolio. Right? Like I'm flashing back to my career 20 years ago, all this work we did to figure out like the right tuning and dials to bring all these different asset classes together. And now like it's basically two clicks of a mouse button, like number one, to pick the model from the list and number two, to start the trading. And and off we go to the next step. And so the the disruption to me, even the extent that we're having it is it's not robo advisors competing against human advisors. It's human advisors that come in and say, this investment management stuff is so automated with the back end platforms we do that I'm adopting a new model where I charge you five thousand dollars for financial planning advice. And you can have unlimited investment management for free because it basically costs me nothing to implement anyways, because I've automated it with technology. Yes. And and those are the kinds of changes that actually create disruption in the industry. But that, that's not robo advisors disrupting advisors. That's human advisors using technology to disrupt other human advisors by using it better than their peers. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I remember, you know, when when as investor, when we started to think about investing in robo advisors as a new fintech category, we realized very soon that declined acquisition costs these robo advisors had were often higher than the long time revenue or the lifetime revenue a client gave them. So it was a very unsustainable business model, you know? So that's what you said after 10 years, you know, the biggest one has got 1% market share. So robo advisors as, as a B2C proposition did not um, 
win, did not, you know, be disruptive as they wanted to become, but as a B2B proposition, it makes perfect sense to support, you know, to support financial planning practices uh, as a business to business offering. And so if we, if we assume that, you know, as allocation uh, via robo advisors can be used, you know, as a tool which financial planners use uh, to reduce the costs. What about the actual advice element? You know, have you seen any support in having algos, you know, supporting uh, financial planners to support them in their advice giving, you know, analyzing global client needs? Because lots of our financial planners deal with global family states. Um, so have you seen development in the, in the sense of using really technology for the financial advice part? Y yes and no. Um because it, it comes in indirect ways in sort of the purest sense of financial planning software that like analyzes your client situation and gives a bunch of algorithms to figure out what the correct recommendation is. And then says like, here it is, here you go. We're, we're not seeing a lot of that. Um, and I, I think it's sort of two, twofold one, just if the answer to the problem is that straightforward, the consumer can probably Google it themselves and find their own answer. And if they can't, someone will just make a direct to consumer thing that says like, enter your bits of data here and we'll just turn out the result. And like the, the advisor gets disintermediated out of that over time. We tend to add values in the, in the play, in, in, tend to add value in the areas that are either so complex that there is no right answer. There's only a decision, right? Like how much is appropriate to leave to your children after you sell your business? There's not a mathematical right answer to this. There's a bunch of really weighty values questions, interacting with tax questions, interacting with estate uh, uh, questions, interacting with legal issues, interacting with business succession issues. There's a whole bunch wrapped up in that. But that's not like a number crunching calculator algorithm answer. That's a really deep, complex family conversation. And whether you're going down the road of business sales, uh, retirement transitions, divorces, you know, advisors in general tend to show up when lives are in transition and moments of complexity hit, because those are the points where I can't just find this on Google and get the answer. It doesn't work. Uh, my problem is more complex than that, or I, as the consumer, are inclined to delegate. So I don't I don't want to figure it out myself. I want to just give someone some money and write a check and, and have them tell me what to do. What, what I'm actually seeing instead in, in technology with uh, uh, facilitating financial planning is, is going as sort of two or three different directions. One is the rise of account aggregation tools to automate pumping data into one place. So like, instead of going out and asking the client, like fill out this form so I can get all your data so I can do my financial planning analysis. Let's just connect your accounts up to it. We'll pipe the data in automatically. And then I've got a live continuous feed of your data. So I know exactly what you need at any particular point on an ongoing basis. And I don't have to ask you for the data, which just lets me give faster planning, more responsive planning. I don't have to wait for a client meeting to find out what's changed in your life so that I can give you new recommendations. I can see it because I got a live continuous stream of your data. So account aggregation is one, although what we find ironically when we look in our uh, advisor research is that advisors that use account aggregation to automate the, the data inputs to their plans spend more time on planning, not less. It doesn't save time it lets them go deeper because you've got more data and richer data and more continuous data. So you can do more proactive planning with clients. And so that's a theme actually that will probably come up more than once today that we're seeing emerging as a trend is the technology isn't helping advisors go faster. It's helping advisors go deeper, which means more value for clients, more value served, command higher fees, better productivity metrics that come from higher revenue per client. But it's not the like, well, we're just going to automate all this stuff down to algorithms so the average advisor can handle 572 clients at a time. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the arc of where technology is going. So we see it feeding account aggregation. That in turn uh, feeds tools that can help prompt advisors to find opportunities because the software says, like, I see your clients off track. You might want to call them. Uh, I see this opportunity cropped up. You might want to reach out to them about that. Uh, their kids are graduating from high school. You might want to reach out and make sure everything's set for the college applications, whatever it is. Uh, the software helps us get more proactive. Uh, and the third domain that, that we're really seeing a lot of change is uh, 
financial planning software becoming more collaborative and interactive with clients. So instead of the traditional world where I gather all your data, I go back to my office, I center your stuff into like my super secret calculator. I do the analysis. I bring the plan back to you that you couldn't get on your own because there's no retail financial planning software that's sophisticated as my tool. Here's the plan. It like funks down on the desk and I charge you uh, a bunch of money for it. What we're seeing emerging instead is well, hey, let's just gather all your information in. I put your plan up on the screen, or maybe even I'm screen sharing it to you in a in a virtual COVID environment. Let's just look at this plan together and see. And so what changes now, you know, like I think of this in, in my early days of planning, you know, we would present a plan to a client. It says, yeah, they they wanted to retire at 64. So we did the analysis for them to retire at 64. And here's how much you need to save in order to get there. And here's how you should be invested. And like the client looks at it, looks at it and says, oh, you know, I, like this is just a little bit, a little bit more uh, aggressive than we planned. Like what, what if we push out retire at 66 instead and just stretch this out a little bit more? And you go, well, well, I didn't print that scenario. I mean, you said you want to retire at 64. So I made you plan retire at 64. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for you to say, what if I retire at 66? And so like a client could blow up a whole meeting in the traditional planning world by saying, well, what if we tried this other thing? Well, when you have the planning software in the meeting, they say, well, what if I retire at 66 to 64? Like, well, I don't know. Let's see, like grab the little slider, drag your retirement age from 64 to 66. Let's look at how the chart changes. And then we can have a conversation about what you're seeing and whether that seems like a better plan for you. Yeah, uh, and and so what we're seeing is planning software in general is leading advisors to go deeper and spend more time. Collaborative planning, though, is pulling down the amount of time because it really starts to reduce plan preparation time. All the scenarios and printing and things that we do in advance of the meeting are saved when we just do it interactively live with the client in the meeting itself. It reminds me back to my days at Morgan Stanley, you know, asset management in the private banking side, where I remember, you know, 20 years ago, people, like you said, you know, we went to client meetings, having our PowerPoint slide decks ready, uh, prepared for one scenario, yep. which was driven by the expectations we had initially agreed with the client. And then once we met the client and we discussed various scenarios, various options, you know, we had no PowerPoint slides to back them up anymore because it was all not live. And now it's so important, you know, to use technology to be live and to be ready for scenario planning, to know live with your client. Yep. So that's, I think, a really key takeaway. Yep. And you talked about aggregation of accounts and, and, and how do you see that, you know, for those financial planners who deal with families who work, who make money in different countries. Have you seen account aggregation solutions who are international and who globally allow aggregation of accounts, not just from one jurisdiction, but also from a global context? Or is it mainly focused per country? So I kind of think of it in, in terms of, well, so two answers. One, there, there definitely seems to be a, a, a country bias to it and that clients are usually still anchored to some home country. The majority of their assets are there. And more importantly, just that that tends to be the base for sort of the home base for wherever their accounts and their financial ecosystem are. And because countries still have such different regulations around uh, uh, their individual financial systems, including and especially what can be done with technology, I find a lot of these tend to start with there's a home country solution that covers your financial system and your accounts there. And then they do whatever they can do to cross into other countries from there. But it's always sort of like it starts home country wherever you are. There's like your country and other and whatever country you're in. It always seems to be your country and other. So here in the U.S., we're seeing players like Adapar have been very active in this space in saying we're going to be the solution, particularly for. Uh, the most affluent clients that are most likely to be global and multinational. We're going to try to solve that cross-country account aggregation solution. While the majority of players here in the U.S. don't even touch that because they've determined, hey, that's a really specialized solution. If you are if you want to play in that space, it's a great opportunity in that space. But otherwise, it's too challenging for them to uh, to cross over. I know that's a little bit different for some other countries around the world. Obviously, we in the U.S., uh, maybe have a little bit more of a tendency to just kind of stay here in the U.S. and not not be as global as uh, as some others. But uh, I I find by and large it's a 
it's a home country first and then we extend to the other countries just in recognition that uh, one of the biggest challenges around fintech, particularly when you talk about it in the global context, is just every solution provider has to localize for individual country rules and regulations. And we don't write them the same from one country to another. Uh, and so it makes the nature of cross-country platforming a really unique challenge unto itself with, with all the usual dynamics that go with that. Bad news, big challenge, lots of regulatory lines to navigate. Good news, uh, high stakes, valuable solution, because frankly, the most money at the end of the day is in the hardest solutions to solve for. Yes, I agree. That's true. And we were just talking about, you know, about how technology can support the value proposition for financial planners. Mm -hmm. And before you spoke about robo advisors, you know, and, and the robo advisory business model, how it has changed. And if a financial planner wants to use robo advisors to help them save costs mm -hmm. or help them, you know, in the operational back office to do, do, do things faster, how would they go about choosing? the right robot advisor back uh, business to business solution, you know, for them. So, so at a high level, I encourage advisors, you really have to think about the technology in your firm uh, across three domains. So there is, there is the back office technology, right? That's where we have things like account, you know, account opening, account paperwork, uh, uh, trading execution, just the, the things that get done to make the system run. There's the front office, which classically is us as advisors sitting across from clients doing the face-to-face -face or virtual face-to-face -face thing. And then there's actually a middle office domain. The middle office is where we get into everything from uh, uh, investment research, uh, portfolio uh, allocation, create, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, creating portfolio allocations. That's also where kind of the financial plan prep work happens is where the compliance support work happens. You know, it's the stuff that's not purely rote and mechanical and repetitive as back office work tends to be over time. It's the stuff where like you, you need a trained professional with a much more specialized skill set to do things, but they're not necessarily out facing the clients. They're doing the support work to, to prepare what goes out to the client. So here's why it's important to think about it that way. Uh, robo advisors frame themselves as being competitors to financial advisors. So, so as I think of that functionally, they position themselves as front office competitors. But the truth is they didn't solve front office problems. In fact, as you noted, they had significant front office problems in the form of really high client acquisition costs because it's challenging to build trust and get people to be willing to hand over their life savings for you to manage whatever your, your platform or offering is. What robo-advisors really solved for was back office functionality around everything from onboarding to uh, uh, client portals to automating trading, and a little bit of middle office around the portfolio design process, which at least happened in a centralized basis. One platform does it for everybody to use it, although that's similar to the turnkey asset management platforms and separately managed accounts that have done that in the advisor space for a long time. So when you think about it from that framing, there's, there's really a couple of different pieces that you're solving for. One is the purely back office end of things. How are you handling onboarding and uh, uh, account creation and transfers and money in and money out and all of those mechanistic functions? Now, what we're actually seeing play out in certainly in the US, and at least I'm seeing in many other countries around the world, is that uh, most advisor platforms, whoever kind of does the raw custody clearing brokerage work of just holds the money or holds an electronic form, like holds the money, tends to be the one that actually facilitates that. Uh, Robo-advisors, particularly here in the US, were a little bit more disruptive because when they first showed up, they built those layers themselves. They built the underlying so that they could do a more effective straight through process. But what's happening here in the US is we're not actually seeing advisors by robo-advisors. We're seeing advisors go to their custodial platforms and say, we want you to do that. Like we want, I mean, who wouldn't want a account opening that you could do from your smartphone in a couple of seconds? Like no advisor, like spending a ton of time with clients going back and forth on the paperwork, but we don't necessarily want to pay for an extra software layer to do it. We just expect our platforms to do it. And what we've seen with a great deal of delay and lag, given when robo advisors first started is a lot of those onboarding and digital processes are now being embedded directly into the advisor platform level 
So it's it's disappearing as a separate layer. We publish a very popular advisor tech map here in the US of just solutions in all the different spaces and categories. And every year that we update it, the number of robo-advisor solutions gets smaller. And it's not because we're not using the tech. It's just that it's becoming so ingrained into the platforms that we don't necessarily need to buy the separate layer. Yes. The second piece that goes on top of that is the middle office layer, designing model portfolios. And that really is becoming a choice for advisory firms. Do you want to build the investment team to do that on a centralized basis as you grow and scale? Or do you want to outsource that? You'll use a third-party manager or separate accounts or whatever the mechanism is in your individual country because say, no, no, my value as on the financial planning side of things, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the investment stuff. I'm just going to farm it out something that's relatively straightforward so that I can add all my value over here in the planning realm. That ironically is technology facilitated in that we can use third-party managers so effectively because they've got all the technology to easily automate this amongst lots of advisors and lots of clients. But I don't actually view that as a technology decision. That's a business model and a value proposition decision around, do you want your value proposition at the end of the day to be built around how you manage the portfolio? Or do you want it to be built around how you give the financial planning advice? When you choose the planning advice, you tend to outsource the investment side the middle office function of the investments. When you make that, you keep that your value proposition, you tend to bring it in and you you hire the CFAs and hire the investment expertise and start building it up in-house. Makes sense. And I think in terms of robo-advice, I mean, in Europe, we had the same experience as you just uh, shared in the States, where we, I remember a few years ago, we had a conference which was called a robo-advisory conference. And this conference doesn't exist anymore, you know, because now robo advisory is part of wealth tech. We call it wealth tech. So yep. all types of technology dealing with wealth management, investment management, and financial planning. Yep. Uh, and so this robo advisory tech itself is now integrated in other bigger yep. solutions. So yep. we we can definitely see the same same trend here. And talking about, you know, financial planning in, in more detail now and how to construct a powerful financial plan, you know, for your clients. Are there any specific areas that planners can utilize uh, to really enhance their value proposition? So starting from Monte Carlo uh, analysis, the sensitivity analysis, to anything you've seen in this space? Yeah, there are a couple of trends I would highlight in this space. The, the, the first I mentioned uh, briefly earlier is, Using planning software more collaboratively, but more importantly, using planning software that's built to be more collaborative. Because the reality from just a, a, a software technology design perspective, you make the software very different if you know you're going to be changing the inputs with the client on the fly in a meeting versus, no, 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 this just needs to be navigable for a para planner who's doing data inputs to produce the plan in the back office. So it's not just on us as advisors to say, hey, let's try being a little bit more interactive with clients. It is a technology change for the platforms themselves to design themselves differently, to be able to be used more collaboratively. And we are seeing more rise of collaborative planning software here in the US. Uh, it's players like uh, eMoney has been strong in this area. Right Capital has been strong in this area. Money Guide has been building more in this area. Uh, Voyant's been doing it more globally. Uh, uh, Plan Plus has been doing it a little bit more globally. So we're seeing first that shift to say planning software is not something that goes in the advisor's office. It goes in the advisor's conference room. And just if you think about that as a mindset shift, a lot of the software and tools start to change. And, and I feel like we are seeing a split now between the ones that are leaning in and embracing a more collaborative approach and the ones who are kind of doubling down on the traditional analytical framework and not necessarily revamping themselves to be more effective in a, in a live client interactive context. Mm, uh, the, the second shift that I, I think we're starting to see is what I would characterize as more dynamic planning models. So, so here to me is, is sort of the challenge that we have in traditional planning software. You, we get situations like, I've done an analysis. I've determined you can spend $4,000 every month in your retirement. Now, we know at the end of the day, the markets will go up and down and do things and that you're probably not going to just get to perfectly spend that consistently over time. Like life's going to happen and we may need to move that number up or down. 
So if a year from now, there's a significant market decline, client comes back in, says like, okay, we're down a bunch. You know, wh what do I need to do? And we say, well, you know, you're okay, but it wouldn't hurt if like you trimmed your spending a little bit just to kind of tighten your belt while things are down until they recover, right? Just a level of prudence. And often we see clients do this naturally anyways, right? When, when the world's in financial meltdown, you're usually not going like, let's spend more money, right? People tend to naturally uh, uh, want to buckle down in that scenario. So we have this plan where the client's going to spend this much money. And if the market declines, they're going to cut their spending. We're going to tell them to cut their spending. They know they're going to cut their spending. We're all in agreement that spending will be cut if the market declines. And then the planning software doesn't in any way, shape, or form account for that. It doesn't have a thing that says, if the market drops by 25%, cl reduce client spending by 10%, which is a fairly simple formulation. Like that's actually really easy to program. It's just like, if this, then that. But we don't tend to do that in planning software tools. We're just seeing it start to arise. So it's tools like Timeline in the UK does this. A uh, big picture app in the US is starting to model it. Right Capital in the US just rolled out a new module to be able to do this. And to me, it, just, it, it gets to the purest sense of what it actually means to plan, which means I have a plan in advance for what may happen in the future. Now, I don't know if that thing is going to happen, right? We, we create plans for things that may or may not actually come true. But that's the whole point of planning is I don't know if this is going to happen, but I'm going to have a plan that if it does, I know what I'm going to do in response in order to deal with that situation. So to me, the biggest irony is, is planning software is actually not very good at planning. It's really only good at modeling today's snapshot in time. But we're seeing planning software start to formulate that way. And, and when you think about it that way, you get very different outcomes. Like Monte Carlo completely changes because if you have dynamic planning, Every client is 100% probability of success always. Yeah. Because you're just going to cut their spending by whatever it takes to get them on track if really bad things happen. So no one ever runs out of money. Now, they may have a standard of living that ends up being lower than they expected because bad stuff happened and they had to tighten their belt and they didn't recover. But you don't fail. Like success versus failure goes out the window. Instead, all the metrics change. Now it's, well, what's the likelihood you have to make an adjustment? How big would the adjustment be? And is that an adjustment you're comfortable with relative to your tolerance for risk and this flexibility of your spending? Yeah. And so that rise of more dynamic planning and really doing planning begins to change how planning happens. But to me, that's a good example of something that's entirely dependent on software. I cannot in my head figure out, well, if the market is up at least 71% over the next six years, then you won't have to cut your spending in a market pullback. But if it's only up 62%, the market pullback is at least 17%, then you will have to cut like, there's a math to that. I can't do that in my head. Like, I need technology to show us where the dynamic moments happen and how we get back on track. But the tools actually don't model that much historically. We're just starting to see that emerge. And it leads to me just much richer conversations with clients, which is not you know, your retirement plan passes or fails. It's, look, everything works. Some entails more trade-offs than others and more adjustments than others. So let's talk about the magnitudes of adjustment, how often the adjustments occur and whether that's the kind of bumpy road that you want or if you want a different one that looks smoother. Yeah. So basically what we're saying is you need technology to survive as a financial planner today. And lots of our financial planners, you know, they might think, well, we are very good in finance. We're very good in planning, but we're not very good in technology because that's, that's why we, that's was never our core, you know, area of expertise. But now all of a sudden it's required from us, you know, building our practice and making it ready to deal with those difficult, complex conversations, as you just outlined, Michael, in the future, yep. that we implement for the first time a proper technology strategy, you know, a technology framework. So what recommendations would you give to somebody who's not a techie, how to get started? So, so I'd answer this thing in two ways. One, just start thinking about your technology in terms of what is back office and what is front office. If you're a little more sophisticated, kind of do back office, middle office, front office, but just functionally, like what software uses behind the scenes and what software gets used in front of clients because it's different and it leads you different directions and where you focus. You know, to me, the, the, you know, the fundamental role of the advisor is to be front office. Like we get paid for the client facing time. Robo advisors ultimately didn't prove to be a threat for us because it wasn't actually front office technology. It was back office technology because that's what account opening and automated trading are. Now, it was 
back office technology that was made available directly to consumers so that they could do it themselves with this back office technology. But it wasn't actually a front office tool. And I think that's part of why we didn't really see robo advisors take market share from advisors, even to the extent robo advisors grew. They didn't take it from advisors. They took it from other do it yourself platforms that said this do it yourself tech experience is better than the old do it yourself online brokerage platform tech experience. So if you think about it in terms of back office and front office, just it helps give it a good initial dividing line. So your core back office systems for most firms start with CRM, some kind of client relationship management software. That's the anchor for every firm. Uh, when you're an individual, it's important just so you can keep back of all, keep track of all the clients and you can keep track for compliance purposes of all the things that you did for them. When you add a second person, it's important so that the other person is up to speed on what you did. The moment you hit three people, CRM systems become absolutely essential for an advisory firm because that's the first moment you reach where two people can work on a client together that the third person was not present for. And if you don't capture all those workflows in one central place, balls start getting dropped because they didn't get handed off from A to B to C because not everybody was in the room together because that's what happens once you get three people. So CRM really becomes the initial anchor. That is very much a back office system that just keeps the wheels running and executing. The second for most advisors is how are you going to keep portfolios managed and maintained? So that may come from your platform. That may be a separate trading uh, uh, option. Uh, that may be a trading option on your platform and a reporting function that's separate. But in some way, we have to capture the portfolio management function and usually sort of two core pieces. How are you going to implement the stuff and how are you going to report the results? The third piece of core tech is the planning tool, is the advice tool. That's increasingly front office facing. It was a middle office. I analyzed the plan and bring you the printout. Now, as it goes more collaborative, it's increasingly a front office tool. And so unlike the others where it's all about efficiency, like how do I get you know faster in a co opening accounts? How do I make it easier to give client reporting results? Planning software increasingly is what conversations will this facilitate with my client? And so sitting down and looking at planning software, not saying how does this make me faster, but how does this lead me to better conversations with clients? It's a very different like technology shopping framework than... Uh, the back and middle office tools. But most firms at the end of the day, CRM, something to handle portfolio management, trading and reporting, uh, and financial planning software advice tools becomes the, the three pieces, kind of the three cores that form the hub of an advisor platform. And then the other components branch off from there. Some are specific to countries, some are specific to uh, business models, some are specific to particular ecosystems. You, know, you, you may have a separate document management e-sign system, or you may use the one that your platform provides. And in terms of costs, you know, how much should a financial planner spend on technology? Is there any gold rule where you'd say it's 10% of revenues per year? Or any numbers you would recommend? Yeah. So when we look in the U.S. at least, because there's a lot of really good benchmarking studies in the, in the U.S. around this, we typically see most firms spend somewhere in the neighborhood of about two to five percent of revenue on technology. Uh, to me, that's actually relatively low relative uh, compared to the economics of uh, advisory firms. But by and large, you know, we are still a service business. The more that technology automates, the more things we can do for clients with the people that we've got, which means our businesses still tend to be dominated by the people. Because again, if you're going to get down to this is so automated that we can just get rid of all the people, like, you're not an advice business anymore. You're just a self-directed technology platform that consumers are using without human service. And that's fine. That's an offering, but like that's not a financial planning advice offering anymore. That's direct to consumer technology. Uh, as long as we're giving an advice proposition, we always as advisors have lived in the layers of complexity above what the technology can increasingly accomplish. So if I compare what the tech does today, all these like amazing uh, 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 tools to uh, facilitate onboarding, asset allocation, automate trading, automate rebalancing. And I compare that to even 20 years ago where I had to do that manually or 40 years ago where I had to make phone calls to execute every single trade for every client. The efficiencies are just mind-numbingly incredible. But advisory firms spend about 5% of revenue on technology 20 years ago in the US, and they spend about 5% of revenue on technology today. The technology does more, right? One of the, well, 
from the consumer ends, from the advisor end, one of the great things about technology is every year it does more without necessarily costing more. It does more and charges less, right? The, the We get these exponential increases in technology improvement over time. Kind of a bummer if you're a technology vendor because you wish you could charge 10x now that you do 10x as much and the market doesn't always bear that. But from the advisor end, our technology just does more and more and more, but we don't necessarily spend a lot more for it. We just get more out of it because that's the nature of rapid iteration technology growth and, and evolution. So we still tend to see that number, two to 5% of, uh, of, of revenue goes towards technology, at least as a benchmark here in the US, while the, you know, the human service end is often anywhere from 70 to 80% of an advisory firm's total expense structure. And that, yeah. that doesn't really seem to change with technology. We just have the humans and the technology do different things because the technology gets better and so the humans do more. But the balance between the two actually hasn't shifted that much. Makes sense. And I think it's all we talk about, you know, upskilling employees and staff to make sure that they everybody's aware about new technologies. This leads us to our topic about the future. You know, the future, Michael, what's the future of technology for financial planners? And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, about blockchain, about cryptocurrencies, you know, about digital assets. I mean, there's so much happening. And how should a financial planner uh, go about being on top of these trends, you know, what is noise, you know, what is serious stuff that you really need to watch out for, you know, how would you guide somebody who wants to stay up to date, uh, what to focus on? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting in our industry that change doesn't happen very fast. Uh, in part, that just because financial services is a highly regulated business. And so regulators, frankly, often slow down the pace of change because there are risks to fast change when money and life savings are at stake. So it's part of that's the nature of the, the highly regulated industry. But part of it is simply the fact that advisory firms don't have a lot of clients turnover. Uh, you know, when we look at at least benchmarking numbers here in the U.S., Typical advisory firms have anywhere from 92 to 95% retention rates. Good firms have 97 to 98% client retention rates. So a 97% retention rate means on average, my client stays for 30 years, more or less the rest of their life. So when it takes me 30 years to rotate through all of my clients with attrition, I don't exactly have a lot of pressure to do a lot of fast change. Because the truth is, even if I lag behind on change, they, they just don't go anywhere. There's a lot of client inertia. I can, you know, sometimes be upset about that because I've seen some really bad advisors that have an astonishingly high client retention rate because of inertia. But for better or worse, clients don't move very fast. And, and that means, frankly, it, it buys us a little bit of time as advisors. And, and the reason why that's important is to me, if you want to plot the future of your advisory firm, like it's really not about finding the, the next new hot technology that's going to like revolutionize the business and disrupt everything. We just don't, we just don't get disrupted. Like I'm trying, I don't want to be lackadaisical about that uh, uh, or too complacent about it, but just in a world where clients don't change that fast and don't move that fast. The industry just doesn't get disrupted that fast, right? That's why at the end of the day, like the massive advent of the of the robo advisor, like one percent market share after ten years, they just don't. People just don't move very fast. So why that's important is is sort of twofold. It means in the short term, finding the next new super hot technology thing that's coming out is not necessarily the big driver of your business. Now, a subset of us out there like to be the early adopters. We love to check out the next new thing that's coming. We want to try it out. We want to be on the front edge. Uh, if you're more of a mainstream adopter, you call that the bleeding edge. But some subset of people will always want to be there. And there's lots of platforms out there to keep up with that. Obviously, you guys publish around that on FinTech Circle. We publish about it on Kitsis.com. Uh, uh, you get a couple of technology consultants that do it, like uh, Jason Pereira in Canada, Craig Iskowitz at Ezra Group here in the U.S. Uh, there's a couple of beat reporters that cover this in the U.S. It's Ryan Neal at Financial Planning, Nicole Kasperson, Investment News, Sam Steinberger at Wealth Management. So there are some media places to follow it, as well as more dedicated niche sites like the T3 
uh, technology uh, team here in the U.S. that covers a lot of advisor technology trends and innovation in particular. But if you're not the early adopter type, you don't you don't necessarily want to be out there on the bleeding edge. The, the truth is you've got some time. Uh, most of your technology will probably come to you through your platform because they'll roll it out. Like you didn't go try a robo advisor. You're getting the benefit of robos because your platform has now made e-sign and digital onboarding and is just making all of that happen for you. The pressure that comes for advisors, particularly those of us who are in the mainstream, you know, the good news is clients don't move very quickly. The bad news is you run the risk of the, the proverbial frog in the boiling pot, where the frog sits in a pot of comfortable water, and then the water keeps getting one degree hotter, and the frog never actually realizes it's boiling because it was so incremental until it's too late, and it sits there in the pot and boils to death. And that, to me, is really the, the risk we go through as, as advisors. It's not because disruption comes fast. It's actually, ironically, becomes because change comes so slowly, but so steadily and so inexorably that if we're not keeping an eye on what your business value proposition needs to look like five and 10 years from now, what happens when you get there is your clients don't necessarily leave in mass because clients just have a lot of inertia and don't go anywhere, but you stop growing. You're no longer competitive in the marketplace. You don't have a compelling value proposition. What you're offering is basically what some technology platform is now doing for free, whatever that is in the future, because it always technology always steps up. And if you're not just thinking of it of saying, what do I need to be doing five to 10 years from now to stay one step ahead of the technology? That to me is where it really matters. And you know, the, the good news, obviously, in the context of uh, being here with FPSB today is to me that that is increasingly about as you had labeled it, the the upskilling of your advisor team, right? How you're reinvesting into the humans to keep them one step ahead. Uh, you know, historically, advisor regulation in most countries had a pretty low bar, like because it was basically a sales bar. You have to understand the things you're selling and the regs that apply to you in order to have a license to sell. You didn't actually need like a degree in financial planning or a graduate degree the way you might in law, accounting, medicine, and other established professions. But that's where we're going. And, and frankly, that's what the technology will force because it's going to increasingly cover the, the common denominator. So to me, when I look at what like what's your opportunity in, in moving forward as an advisor, it's how are you upskilling yourself the, as a firm and as an individual? It's CFP marks. It's post-CFP designations after the CFP marks. It's forming even deeper niches and specializations so that even when artificial intelligence starts coming through, it's only going to cover the most common Denom lowest common denominator layer. There's always room to have expertise above it, right? Computers have gotten millions of times more powerful than they were 40 years ago, and we still have jobs. Like yeah. it, it didn't go away, but we do more complex stuff than we used to because it used to be people doing a lot of accounting work by hand that now QuickBooks and Excel just like automates in a second. Mm -hmm. So the pressure is on for how we upskill ourselves. And at that point, it makes me very excited about the technology because the technology just prompts better conversations and opportunities. So like when I envision a planning firm years from now, when I look five to 10 years out, I mean, I see a vision like this. You, you, uh, you, you're, you're coming into the office. It's mid July. You've just come back from well, at least here would be a summer vacation. Maybe it's a winter vacation. If you're on the other side of the hemisphere, uh, you're coming into the, office back back from vacation in july and up pops three alerts from your financial planning software this morning the first alert says last week while you were out the market was down it has significant pullback now the good news most of your clients are okay we've already sent them automatic notifications to let them know but these two clients these two are veering dangerously off track for their retirement plan you need to give them a call this morning and let them know that they need to make some spending adjustments so that they stay on track not all, you're not your other 117 clients. They're fine. But these two have a meaningful phone call to happen this morning. Then the next alert pops up. The next alert says, well, these three clients could do a mortgage refinance this morning. Because of course the market sold off last week, which meant stocks were down, which meant bonds were up, bonds rallied, which meant yields were down and yields are down so far that these three clients could do a mortgage refinance this morning and save a material amount of money on their ongoing budget. So and so not your good. other 116, like just call these three. Yes. And so we get to a realm where the software identifies the meaningful conversation opportunities, but there's still conversations, right? 
telling a client bad things happen in the market, you need to change your standard of living is not something we take well from software. Telling someone you have to change your debt structure. We have a very emotional feelings around debt. Those are not automated transactions. They're, they're human conversations. But we can have better conversations because to me, what artificial intelligence can end up doing is queuing up for us the exact right conversations to have at the right moment. And that just adds even more value for the work that we do with clients. That's great, Michael. I think that's, I think, really summarize it very well. The technology will help us to see almost as alerts, you know, what is really worth spending our human capital on and our human conversations on, uh, because it's the basis which helps us navigate our businesses, grow our financial practices, uh, because it's as a tool, you know, which we should use to really improve our working working lives and i think in in summary i really enjoyed you know really the conversation the insights hopefully you all uh, gained you know by listening to our dialogue just now about how technology can take your financial planning practice to the next level it's uh, important to be upskilled. It's important to be on top of things. At the same time, you don't need to worry that you've lost uh, the, the kind of the advancement because it's still luckily enough time to implement the right solutions around fintech or wealth tech solutions. And it's, uh, but it's a, it's a time to act now, I guess. That's, you know, what we want to say. It's important to act now, to invest in the, in the employees, uh, upskilling them with the various courses available uh, and in the invest in the right technology, but always to the benefit of your end customers and to the uh, to your end team and your uh, culture as well in your in your practice. So with that said, I would like to thank you, Michael, very much for the My great pleasure. conversation. And I would love to hand over now to our moderator, JD, and welcome him back to our our webinar. Wow. Wow. Thanks, guys. What a great conversation. Thanks so much to you both. Um, I, for me, that time really flew by. I know I learned a lot and I would love to hear even more. So maybe someday you'll you'll be willing to come back and, and visit us again. But Suzanne, Michael, thank you so much both again for being with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all of our viewers around the world. Just before you go, I do want to invite you to our next event, uh, which is World Financial Planning Day on Wednesday, October 6th. That's just about a month away. So we would love to see you on October 6th at our global panel event. We'll have experts from around the world ready to explore the topic of the future of client needs and advice delivery. So check out worldfpday.org for information on the live panel event and other events as well that we'll be doing um, around that time. That's World fpday.org. And right now, stay tuned for a very quick preview of this world, this year's World Financial Planning Day. And thanks again to everybody for tuning in.